Now that we know what hash tables are, let's dig into some more details about where they're implemented and how they work. We've previously seen that the C++ standard template library type standard map and standard set are typically implemented using search trees, specifically red-black trees, which are a kind of self-balancing BST, kind of like AVL trees. C++11 added the STL types unordered map and unordered set, which are based on hash tables. We can query internal details of the hash table, such as the number of buckets or the current load factor, using public methods that are now part of the standard. Take a moment now to look at a couple of these methods on your favorite C++ reference site and find the answer to our first questions. 1. What is the default maximum load factor for an unordered set? And 2. What can we infer about the internal implementation using this information? As a hash table gets full, its performance degrades because we need to spend extra time dealing with collisions, both on insert, where we need to find somewhere to put the new data, and on lookup, since we may need to do some iteration to find the correct value. In a hash table that uses quadratic probing and that has a load factor over one half, we may not even find anywhere to put the new data. As the hash table fills up then, we need to add additional space to it. The trouble is, our hash function maps values to integers in the range 0 through n, not 0 through 2n. If we change the hash function, all of the existing keys or values may map to new places in the table. There's no way around this problem. Whenever we enlarge a hash table, we need to rehash, that is, go through all of the existing entries in the table and calculate new locations for them in the expanded hash table. This is a linear operation. Recalculating one hash code is a constant time operation, but we have lambda n recalculations to perform. If we're going to keep our constant time insertions, we had better not rehash the whole table too often. If we follow the same strategy as vector growth, that is, making sure we double in size every time we grow, then an order n rehash will only happen after adding n entries to the table, so the overall asymptotic performance is still linear. However, it's worth noting that the insertion that puts us over the maximum load factor will be much more expensive than the insertions that precede it. So far we've talked about hash table performance as constant time, but you will likely have observed that it's constant time in the best case, not necessarily the worst case. The average case performance of a hash table operation is also constant time, but clearly it's possible to choose a hash function that, for some pernicious input data, will create lots of collisions and thus lots of work on insertion and lookup. For example, a hash function that, for a given data set, happens to hash all keys to the same hash code, will end up having order n operations rather than order 1. This might seem unlikely if we choose a reasonable hash function, but in some spheres unlikely isn't good enough. If you need time guarantees, or if you're worried about an attacker influencing the keys in a hash table, we need to go further. One way to guarantee constant time performance is using a technique called perfect hashing. It is possible to build a so-called perfect hash function if we know all possible keys in advance. Firstly, it can be shown that, if we build a large enough hash table, we can have a better than 50% chance that a random distribution of values to hash codes will cause no collisions whatsoever. If we're happy to build such a large hash table, we can generate random hash functions until we find one that has no collisions, and we're done. How can we generate a hash function? by choosing random parameters for the expression ax plus b mod p mod m, where m is the size of the table and p is a prime number larger than m. It can be very efficient to compute the modulus of p if p is a Mersenne prime, which is a prime number that's one less than a power of two. For example, two to the seven minus one is a prime number, as is two to the 13 minus one. So, Given a value of m, we can choose p to be the next largest Mersenne prime, leaving just a and b for random selection. With a large enough hash table, we should only need to try a few candidate hash functions before we find one that works. However, what is large enough? That's the unfortunate part. We need a hash table of size m equals n squared. That's a pretty big hash table, unworkable in practice. However, perfect hashing isn't quite dead yet. Instead of building a hash table with n squared entries, we can build a regular sized hash table, suffer a few collisions, and, whenever we have a bucket with colliding values, 
store those values within a second level hash table. Each of these buckets should only have a few entries, so we can afford to make those hash tables quadratic in size. So, our overall strategy is to use one randomly selected hash function for the first level hash table, and then to randomly select hash functions for each second level table, where the size of each second level table gives us a high probability of finding a collision free hash function within the first couple of tries. This all sounds like a lot of work, but it's not work that we have to do at runtime, it's work that is done at build time. Also, there are tools available to automate parts of the process. See, for example, the open source gperf tool. People are also working on dynamic perfect hashing algorithms that relax the assumption that we know all of the keys in advance, but they're a bit more complicated. I'll leave those as further reading in chapter 5, if you're interested. So that's a bit about how and where the STL implements hash tables, how and when we rehash the entries in a hash table, and how we can guarantee constant time performance. We'll play a bit with STL hash tables and their rehashing behavior, as well as gperf, in our in-class exercises.